Good evening and welcome to our online Bible class of the Southwest Church of Christ for Wednesday, Wednesday evening, April the 29th, 2020. We're so happy that you're able to join us for our online study from the book of Isaiah. It appears our prayers have been answered and that we'll be able to assemble once again together in the church building this Sunday morning, uh, May the 3rd, for our worship service. I'll have more to say about that in just a moment. There are a number of people we need to continue to remember in our prayers who have medical problems or other challenges in their lives at this particular time. Joe Wallace's nephew and his wife Justin and Sidney Wallace lost their baby boy, Dakin, Saturday morning. He had been in ICU in Fort Worth since his birth two weeks ago. They have a very difficult time and are struggling. Prayers and cards would certainly be appreciated this time for them and their sister, Tegan. Everett Clare, the father of Elaine Hopkins, has tested positive for COVID-19. So they have moved him to a different room at West Oaks Rehab. His room is now 207B. Please keep him in your prayers as he's very weak at this particular time. Caroline Little is out of quarantine at Ledgestone and is back at her assisted living apartment with John. If all goes well, she and John will be able to stay in their apartment and will not be able to, uh, pardon me, will not have to go to the memory uh, care area. Concerning face masks, Lee Stewart has made a number of masks for our members. I have some in the office this, or there will be some in the office this Thursday and Friday and we will have some available Sunday morning for those who will need them for worship service. An announcement concerning our Lightpost app. If you know of someone who is still not getting the emails, please let the office know. Also, you can update your information on Lightpost by going to the app.lightpost.app for your, on your computer. It can be done from a phone. Or pardon me, it can't be done from a phone. It has to be done from a computer. One glitch with a light post, if you're unable to find a member in the directory just by typing in their last name, uh, for some reason, some members are only showing up when their last name is typed in. We're notifying the developer, so hopefully this issue can be resolved soon. Please refer, refer to the prayer list on the website for the Lightpost app for others who have medical problems or other challenges in their lives. One more announcement I do have. Hello, my sincere thanks to all of you involved in making it possible for our extended worship during this crazy and scary times. I truly enjoy and appreciate your work in making this possible. May God bless you all. And this is from Peggy Branch. Thank her for that. As I said earlier, we, we will meet this Sunday morning and evening for worship service. There will be no Bible class uh, here at the building this week. The online Bible class that Cody has been conducting will be available this Sunday morning. We will send an email concerning guidelines for our worship service beginning this Sunday. There are things that you'll need to be able to uh, know about and to follow. You'll be asked to wear a mask. You'll be asked to wash your hands. You'll be asked to maintain physical distancing. There are guidelines for those who are 65 and older that may be followed. If you feel uncomfortable about the crowds that you would be around, uh, it's possible you may stay at home or you can meet in the annex where the service will be streamed to the annex where there will be fewer people who you'll be around. Also, the service will also be streamed online so that you can watch it at home or worship at home if you're unable to be here. Remember the church office will be open on Thursday and Friday from 10 a.m. to noon for those who need communion supplies or wish to leave their contribution if you're not going to be here. 
This will continue until further notice. If you have any needs, uh, please let the elders know or please contact the church office. Well, we miss each of you and hopefully we'll be able to see all of you this Sunday morning, although we realize some of you will not be able to be with us at that time, but we certainly have missed all of you and look forward to being together once again. Now, would you please open your Bibles to the book of Isaiah and be prepared to follow Brother Lloyd as he directs us in our study in the book of Isaiah. Would you bow with me in prayer? Our holy and righteous Father in heaven, we give thanks unto thee for all the many blessings in life that you've so richly blessed us with. Father, we're so thankful unto thee for your love, your mercy, for your long-suffering, and for your greatest expression of love ever, the sacrifice of the only begotten Son, Jesus the Christ, who suffered and died upon that cross of Calvary for our sins. And we're thankful, Father, for the blood of Christ and the power in his blood to cleanse us from all our sins. Father, we pray that you be with Brother Lloyd as he directs us in our study this evening of the book of Isaiah. We pray that he's organized his thoughts that we'll be able to understand the things that he presents and will help us to understand the book of Isaiah much better. Father, we know a number of people who've been mentioned who have health concerns and others who have challenges in their lives. We pray for them that the things that are being done will help each of them to overcome those problems. We pray for those who have lost loved ones. We pray that they'll be comforted at this, at this time. Father, we pray that you continue to be with us and we pray, Father, that as Christians, as we're out in the world, that we'll let our light so shine before men that they may see the good works that we're doing and glorify thee in heaven. For this is our prayer through Jesus our Savior. Amen. Welcome back to our study of the book of Isaiah. As I have said before, we are jumping around the book some in an effort to get through it, but hopefully covering it in such a way that it will help make sense of the whole as you read it for yourself. In a class I teach here at the school on uh, counseling, I emphasize to students that many of the problems we face in life are problems of living. Uh, what I mean by that is to separate problems of living from problems like uh, medical uh, physical ailments like cancer or COVID-19, uh, things of that nature, the flu, those are conditions. But many of the real serious problems we face are, if I may say, spiritual in nature. One man said, once you become aware that the main business that you are here for is to know God, most of life's problems fall into place of their own accord. I first read that several decades ago, and I still think it's true. If we come to terms with the fact that our main business for being here, for existing, is to know God and to glorify Him, other things seem to fall into place. When we fail to recognize that our primary purpose is to glorify God, uh, that's when the problems many times start uh, surfacing. Israel of old was no different. Israel as a nation, if uh, not uh, much, if not all of their political and social problems were rooted in their ignorance of the nature and the identity of God. Isaiah went a long way toward helping them to understand the God who created them and nurtured them as much as they would let him throughout their national history. So our lesson today brings us to Isaiah chapters 40 through 48, which I think of as Isaiah's uh, theology lesson for the nation of Israel, especially for Judah, Isaiah 40 through 48. Let me illustrate before we get into the meat of this lesson. Let me ask you two questions. First of all, to what extent do you believe an individual's behavior would be altered if they believed that what they did escaped God's notice. 
if any, whatever you did escaped the notice of God, do you think that would affect the way you behave, the way you live your life? The second question is the flip side of that, and uh, it is to what extent do you think an individual's behavior or your, your, your behavior would be altered if you believe nothing you did escaped God's notice? Look at Isaiah chapter 40. I want to encourage you to have your Bibles open because there, there are a number of passages in this section of Scripture that I want us to look at. And I think if you read the words as I read them along out loud, it might be uh, more beneficial, it might have a greater impact on your thinking. Isaiah 40, beginning in, in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and the justice due me escaped the notice of my God. What does that imply about their belief in the nature and the identity of God? How do you suppose it affected? Well, we don't have to suppose, do we? All we have to do is read the Old Testament to see how it affected the way they lived. One other thing before we launch into Isaiah 40 through 48 is this. What God chooses to reveal about himself in these chapters of Isaiah's prophecy are not arbitrary. It is provoked by the condition of the time. Now, we've not taken a look at the preceding chapters. Uh, if I may suggest going back to our last uh, lesson from chapters thir 13 through 23, uh, that was a series of judgments or oracles of God against the nations, Jerusalem included. But you could extend this idea of God's judgment against the nations and against his own people all the way up to chapter 39. So 13 through 39 could be uh, seen as a section on God's judgment against them. The emphasis in 13 through 23, of course, would be on the oracles and the judgments of God against these various nations. Uh, the latter part of that section of Scripture, we find a number of woes, W-O-E, God pronouncing woes against uh, various groups. So toward the end of that section, 13 through 39, we find in chapters 36 through 39 uh, some historical information there was a man named Rabshaki who had launched a number of, of verbal missiles over the walls of Jerusalem in an effort to intimidate Judah and her king. One of the many lines of reasoning he used appeals to the impotence of the other gods of the nations to help them in a time of trouble. So now let me put this in historical perspective as well. There are three major crises that the book of Isaiah addresses or spans. The first crisis is the connection between Syria and Judah in their efforts against, I'm sorry, uh, Syria and Israel joining hands in their efforts against Judah. The second crisis that we find in the book of Isaiah is, Sir, uh, is Assyria right, raising up in power and then finally destroying Israel and taking them off into captivity and destruction. And then the third major crisis in the book, or addressed in the book, is the rise of the Babylonian Empire and God's use of them in his destruction of the uh, temple and the, the people of Judah. All right, so it's when Assyria is rising up against uh, the uh, the northern nation of Israel, that we, f we find this incident. Uh, Rabshaki is outside the walls of Jerusalem, and he is, he is taunting Israel to think about how useless and impotent the gods of other nations were when he came up against them. And here's what he says. This is in chapter 36 of Isaiah, verses 18 through 20. 
Has any one of the gods of the nations delivered his hand from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arpad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And when have they delivered Samaria from my hand? Who among the gods of these lands have delivered their land from my hand, that the Lord, Yahweh, should deliver Jerusalem from my hand? Do you see the argument he's making? He's trying to get them to, to relent because none of the other, the gods of the other nations did not help them when he went up against them. And his point is, what makes you think that your God, whose name is Yahweh, is going to help you in the time of this crisis? And so a people ignorant of the God of heaven would have had no response. They would have no response. Chapter 39 warns Judah that after the reign of Hezekiah, Judah will fall at the hand of the Babylonians. So that brings us to chapters 40 through 48. And these chapters are designed to help prepare Judah for what lies ahead. All of this fits into the overall scheme of God uh, in redeeming man from his sins. And one other point I want to make before we get into chapters 40 through 48 proper. Way back in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God told the children of Israel, separating them into six tribes each, six of them on Mount Gerizim and six on Mount Ebal, which later is referred to as the Mount of Blessings and Cursings. God, God tells the children of Israel, if you are faithful and obey me, all of these blessings will accompany you in your life. And it it's a list of benefits, uh, benefits to herds and to the land and to crops and to their productivity. Everything is, is uh, full of life and uh, productive and it's fruitful. But on the other hand, if they are disobedient and live a life of disrespect to him or toward him, then in all the ways they could be blessed, they will be cursed. The land will not produce, the flocks will not produce, they will not produce. And one of the fundamental issues he brings up is the retention of the promised land. If you are unfaithful to me, then you will be stripped from the promised land. And of course, in 722 to 721 BC, that's when the Assyrians are, are raised up by God to destroy the northern tribes of Israel and in 606, 597, and 586 B.C., the southern tribes are troubled and ultimately destroyed, the temple destroyed as well by Babylon. But six to seven hundred years before that occurs, Moses writes in Deuteronomy 30, verses 17 and 18, If your heart turns away and will not obey but are drawn away and worship other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land where you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess it. So he's telling him centuries before what Isaiah is prophesying will occur, uh, what will take place. Six to seven hundred years Prior. That's one of the great marks of Scripture, isn't it? That these writers were able to foretell by the power of God and by the Word of God things that took place before they took place so that they would know who God was. If I were to give uh, Isaiah 40 through 48 a title, something that identified the what I thought to be the prominent theme of these nine chapters, it would be the incomparability, incomparability, am I saying that right? Incomparableness of God. You cannot, in other words, compare him appropriately with anyone or anything else. That tells me that God is in a category all his own. And that's what the children of Israel forgot. They did not sanctify him 
Remember Jesus, as he taught the disciples how to pray, he said, pray after this manner, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And by that he meant, by hallowed, holy, you know, may he be kept apart, set apart from the rest. And that's not an arbitrary thing. It's because God, by his very nature, is set apart from all else and everyone else. But listen to some of these passages from this range of texts from Isaiah 40 through 48. In chapter 44, verse 6, he says, There is no other God besides me. He says the same thing in chapter 45, verse 21. And notice this question from chapter 40, verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness will you compare with him? Of course, those are rhetorical questions, but what's implied by the question is that you cannot compare God adequately with anyone or anything else. Isaiah 44, verse 7 reads, Who is like me? Again, a rhetorical question implying its own answer. And Isaiah 44, verse 8, Is there any God besides me? Not only is he incomparable, but one of the reasons you cannot compare him with anyone else is because there is no other God with which you can compare him. Let's look at some other passages here. Uh, I'm going to forewarn you, I'm going to do uh, quite a bit of reading because of the significance of these passages. If you have your Bible, I hope you'll open it with me to Isaiah 40, and beginning in verse 18 and reading through verse 26. I know that's lengthy, but uh, focus your attention on these words. This is the word of God. Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 18. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol. A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and cast for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out the skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told, uh, told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. He brings or who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth when he blows on them and they wither and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Now look at verse 18 again. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? Verse 25 again. To whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. So by emphasis, the author Isaiah here is asking us rhetorically to compare God with whoever we like and ask if there is any comparison to be drawn. And of course, the point is God is incomparable. You cannot, that's what in, I-N means, not comparable. To, he's not comparable with anyone or anything else. That's something we all need to hold fast to. Look at Isaiah chapter 44, if you will, verses 6 through 8. Isaiah 44, verses 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. 
That sounds like a statement made about Jesus in the book of Revelation. I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Who is like me? Let him proclaim it. Let him declare and set it before me, since I appointed an ancient people. Let them declare what is to come and what will happen. Fear not, nor be afraid. Have I not told you from of old and declare it? And you are my witnesses. Is there a God besides me? There is no rock. I know not any. So again, the the greatness of God is being depicted here in that he is not to be compared with anyone or anything else. Now think with me for just a moment on this before we go any further about the implications of that. If God himself as a being, his nature and his identity is unlike anyone or anything else, how then do we come to a knowledge of this God and of his nature and of his, uh, his character and his attributes, his very being, the essence of God? I would like to submit to you that outside of the few things that we can know about God from nature, as stated in Psalm 19.1 and Romans 1 verse 20, so, uh, Acts 14 even includes the seasons. God has not left himself without witness by virtue of the seasons. You know, we get the, the cyclical nature of winter, spring, summer, and fall. And we know what comes next after winter is spring, and what comes after spring is summer, what comes after summer is fall over. And Paul is suggesting that that is one of the uh, evidences God has left of his existence. So, but aside from that, the, uh, the amazing uh, character and qualities of God uh, can, I think, only be known by him, made, made known by him and through his word. You and I, I think, are utterly dependent on God for telling us who he is and what he's like. And so that's why with both ears open and mouth shut, we should be reading and poring over the pages of Scripture, hopefully like we are to some degree in our lesson today, to get to know who God is. That is precisely the problem of Israel and Judah in the days of Isaiah. They forgot who God was. I think that is the significance. Think of the significance of the incomparableness of God where the politics of Judah were concerned. First and foremost, take into consideration the various political alliances that Judah had been tempted to form to ensure her protection from Assyria. You know, if they had God on their side, who else did they need? If God is for us, Paul asks, who could be against us? Syria and Israel tried to convince Ahaz to join forces with them. And later, Judah would place her confidence in the military might of Egypt, according to chapter 30. What were these foreign nations compared to God? What were they compared with God? And in chapter 40, I think we covered this a moment ago, chapter 40, verses 12, following... No, let's look at that. Isaiah 40. This is answering an attempt to answer the question, uh, what were the nations when compared with God? <coughs> Excuse me. Isaiah 40. Hope you have your Bibles open. Isaiah 40, verse 12. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand and marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales and the hills in a balance. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord? Or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult? And who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice and taught him knowledge and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted 
as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for burnt offering. All the nations are as a nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. What a powerful way to describe the contrast or the differences between God and the nations. How do you compare finite might and finite strength with infinite strength and the infinite might of God? This should have, of course, moved Judah to place their confidence in no one but God. Years ago, I remember getting a sheet of paper out and drawing a line down the middle of that page, and I, I put um, on the left column uh, things we should not place our confidence in, and in the right column I, I put uh, as a heading uh, things in which we should place our confidence. And so for a while I developed a list, and the list on the left-hand side got pretty big. You know, you're not to place your confidence in yourself, you're not to place your confidence. Israel was not to place their confidence in the nations, in particular Egypt, um, and on and on. Israel was not to place their confidence in horses and chariots. I guess that's equivalent to military might. And then in the right-hand column, I found only two things the Bible tells us to place our confidence in. One is God, and the other is His Word. Those are the only two things we're to place our confidence in as believers in God. And I think that's where Judah went wrong. They placed their confidence in everyone and everything but God. His incomparableness should have had some impact where their idolatry was concerned as well. Let me bring up one other point here, and then we're going to close, and I'll pick this up, uh, Lord willing, next week. If Judah had kept in mind what they had been taught through Moses in the law, what sense would it have made for them to follow other gods? After identifying himself as the one who would deliver the children of Israel from Egyptian bondage, back in the book of Exodus, listen to verse 3. You shall have no other gods before me. The children of Israel were violating the first. If it is the first in importance, uh, they were violating the very first of the laws the Ten Commandments, the Ten Words given by God through Moses in Exodus 20. I encourage you to read Exodus 20, verses 4 through 6, as God emphasizes the significance of that. So this being the case, what sense did it make for Judah to clamor after the so-called gods? The insulting thing is that they were no gods at all. You know, Paul even emphasizes in 1 Corinthians that we know that no idol is anything in the world and that there is no God but one. Let me read uh, one other passage and then I want to assign you a text that's rather lengthy, but I think you'll appreciate the ramifications and the significance of it on your own. Let's look at Isaiah 42. Isaiah 42 beginning in verse 14 and reading through verse 17. Again, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along. Isaiah 42, beginning in verse 14. For a long time I have held my peace. I have kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. I will lay waste mountains and hills and dry up all their vegetation. I will turn the rivers into islands and dry up the pools. And I will lead the blind in a way that they do not know. In paths that they have not known, I will guide them. I will turn the darkness before them into light, the rough places into level ground. These are the things I do, and I do not forsake them. They are turned back and utterly put to shame, who trust in carved idols who say to metal images, you are our gods. And of course, Israel said that to their shame. Now, the passage I want to leave you with 
And you don't want to miss reading this because it is really a profound passage like the ones we've already covered. But let me encourage you to read Isaiah 44, verses 9 through 20. Read it out loud. And if you're with someone, read it together. Because in it, Isaiah depicts the folly of idolatry, of how a man takes a piece of wood, and with a bit of it, he makes a fire to cook his food, and with some of it, he forms an idol that stands up something like a man, and then he worships it, worships the objects, the object of his very hands. How like or unlike God was that idol? What sense did it make to trust in non-entities? Of course, to them, they were real, I guess, in their hearts. But these were things that did not exist. If Paul is right, and you and I know he is, and no idol is anything in the world, and that there is no God but one, what sense did it make to trust in these idols? I'll see you next week.